So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Aisha Delaney Rumsey. I'm the director of the Behavioral Health Division at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I am your Crisis Jam host or facilitator for today. I'm very, very excited um, to hear from our um, featured speaker, Erica Chestnut Ramirez, who's the regional B VP for La Frontera Arizona um, Impact SPC. Um, she will be talking with us. This is part of a two-part series. She'll be talking with us about how we should be thinking about scaling up emergency behavioral health services. And this is really a follow-up from last week's conversation where she talked about the history of emergency health services. And so what we'll be doing is thinking about how we can learn from the history of emergency physical health services to really scale up emergency behavioral health services. Um, and you see the link for that um, previous session in the chat. So as always, this is one of my favorite slides. This just shows the number of organizations and the level of engagement that this learning community has. Um, I love to see that because it's so exciting to see how many people are thinking about and engaging with this issue. If you're a national organization that participates and you don't see your name listed, please just email Karen and she will make sure that you are um, your organization is listed. I know there were a few that were already added uh, last um, last week. Um, and I think Karen will go, yep, great. Karen just sent her, put her email in the chat. Another thing to call your attention to is there was a special episode on a special edition around youth in early January that's now getting lots of engagement both on YouTube, but also um, live. And so if you haven't seen that, definitely go back and look at that. You know, youth crisis is an area where there's still lots to do and a lot of um, interest in learning more. So I'm I'm sure that um, the Crisis Gems host will be continuing to focus on that, but that's been an area of uh, uh, great interest. Next slide. If you're having any issues, you can use the link that is uh, in the chat to make sure that you do have the Crisis Jam link on your calendar every week so you don't miss any of the great information that comes through, um, through, comes through this forum. And as always, if you have, need any information about the Crisis Jam, go to talk.crisisnow.com. You can always get the Zoom link. You can see previous sessions. You can see what's coming up. You can sign up for the newsletter. Um, it also has all of the highlights. This is a resource, truthfully, that I use all the time for myself, um, and I'm constantly sending um, some of the newsletters or the sessions to other people I work with. So that's also a good um, a good way just to keep you and your network um, apprised of uh, uh, key issues in the crisis system. Next slide. So we have two um, uh, pieces of news to focus on today. We're going to do this a little bit differently. I'm actually going to call up Dr. Richard McKeon from SAMHSA to give a little bit of a comment on these two um, pieces of news. The first one is that the CDC released a report noting that suicides rose in 2021 after two years of decline. Um, and the next piece of news, you'll, we'll drop both the links in the chat, but the next piece of news from the next slide um, is noting that in the State of the Union, President Biden focused on addiction, mental health care policies, and as opportunities for bipartisanship, which definitely reflects um, certainly my experience of working in an organization that's bipartisan. That this that this area of focus, behavioral health, the crisis work, is one that has um, good opportunities for bipartisan support. Dr. Richard McKeon, are you on the line with us yet? I am. I am here. Great. Do you want to just give um, your perspective on both of those pieces of information or news? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think these two pieces of news underscore both the challenges and the opportunities of the current moment, right? The two CDC reports, <clears throat> one uh, looked at the 2021 data, also mortality, morbidity, weekly review compared the last, I think it was four years, 2018 to 2021. Um, and um, on, one, on one level, what we saw was that the gains in national suicide um, deaths that were present in 2019 and somewhat surprisingly in 2020, given the uh, pandemic, 
were unfortunately erased in 2021. Um, and it also showed that um, when you look at the trends, uh, that the the patterns that we are seeing, the trends that we are seeing are, are, are not equitable, right? And in particular, we're seeing rising suicide among communities of color. And also you know, concerns among young people. And the other report that came out was the CDC's um, uh, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which comes out every two years. Um, it, that does not uh, uh, measure mortality, but it measures suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, um, as well as a variety of, of other experiences and risks, uh, such as sexual assaults. They're, they're, so these are important documents. Unfortunately, the YRBS also showed significant increases in suicidal ideation and attempts particularly among adolescent girls. Um, so this is very important to be aware of. And part of the challenges that we are facing, I do think in terms of youth, it underscores the importance of the 988 chat and text services, which are disproportionately used by youth in getting out the word on their availability. So um, while you know, while these reports um, are um, imbued with uh, tragic data, um, the other part of what's important to be focusing on is the unprecedented opportunity that we have now, both in terms of crisis systems, uh, but also in, in terms of mental health and substance use issues more generally. And I think the president's uh, incorporation of addiction and mental health care policies um, and his call for bipartisanship. And these efforts have been largely uh, bipartisan. Um, it, it really reflects a, a unique opportunity that's unprecedented in my almost 20 years of federal service. And we've certainly had previous administrations, previous Congresses that have been helpful and supportive. But I think what we have now is a unique opportunity over the next year or two. And the challenge for us is to get it right. And to do that, we all need to be working together. So I think these news articles really juxtapose both our challenges as well as our opportunities. So thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, um, Richard. I think that you raised a number of points that I um I think are really spot on, of course, <laughs> as always. But I really appreciated what you said about the um, really needing to focus on youth and BIPOC communities. I think both that um, the interest in the youth session on the Crisis Jam really reflects the recognition that we're all having that our youth are not being supported and served in the way that we need to. Um, and I know that later on in the session, um, we're also going to be looking at one of the Moving America's Souls um, on suicide um, and the focus there on uh, recognizing that suicide is not um, is um, under supported among uh, BIPOC communities. Um, and as well, I definitely have a similar feeling about the, this being a moment where there is significant attention at the federal level and across um, both sides of the aisle within this. So I just really appreciate you providing those um, that uh, uh, summary and feedback. Thank you so much. Um, next slide. So this is actually a quote from a previous um, uh, Crisis Turk article. Um, Dr. Uh, John Sierra, law enforcement shouldn't be on the scene of a mental health crisis unless there's a clear logical reason to have the presence of an armed public servant. Um, this is a sentiment that in the time that I've been doing work at the intersection of mental health and criminal justice, I've seen expressed more and more, both by the behavioral health system, but also law enforcement and public safety system themselves, a recognition that the, our public safety resources are meant for a specific set of challenges or needs and that they are, um, and that they should not be sent. 
for behavioral health crises unless there's really a specific and logical reason to use them. So I really love this quote because I think it um, showcases where the um, where people's feelings around crisis services and public safety services have really moved over the last few years. Um, just a reminder to mute yourself if you are not talking. Next slide. And now I'm really excited to bring up um, our featured speaker. Um, Erica, can I call you forward? I know you're going to be talking to us about the um, ways we can learn from the expansion and the um, uh, improved efficiencies among the within the emergency medical system to think about how to scale the emergency behavioral health system. Very excited to hear this um, presentation. Thank you, Aisha, and thanks everybody for having me today. It's an honor to speak with all of you. Um, so my name is Erica Chestnut Ramirez, as Aisha mentioned. I oversee a large behavioral health organization in central Arizona, Impact Suicide Prevention Center. And our roots are actually in our name. Uh, Impact is uh, stands for Emergency Medical, or excuse me, Emergency Mobile Be. Uh, pediatric and adolescent crisis teams. And that's really where our roots are from 1987. So we've been doing mobile crisis since then. And we've expanded uh, astronomically. We serve all populations at this point. We are the largest mobile crisis provider in the state of Arizona. We have 19 mobile crisis teams that operate within a 24 hour period at any uh, on any given day. And we also have uh, private contracts with uh, universities within the state of Arizona, as well as uh, tribal entities. Um, we became a lifeline center in 2005, and we've continued to do that work uh, currently. And we are a national backup. We are a um, national uh, chat and text center, as well as recently being named the Contingency Center for the Veterans Crisis Line. So it is with that uh, context that I come to you today to talk to you about uh, transforming emergency behavioral health services. And last week, um, Dr. Eric Rafleon gave an amazing presentation on the transformation of emergency medical services that began in the 1960s, and basically how we got to where we are today uh, with the use of the 911 system. And today I'm going to be talking about how we do that again. How um, is our emergency behavioral health system transforming and how do we continue to transform it? Uh, next slide. Oh, next slide. Okay, so as I listened to um, Dr. Eric Rafleon's presentation last week, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend uh, that you watch it so that you could draw some of the same parallels that I did, but I couldn't help but see the parallels between the emergency medical services transformation and currently what we're going through with the emergency behavioral health crisis system. Um, in the 1960s, there was a reliance on law enforcement and coroners and even funeral home staff to transport individuals to the hospital when they were experiencing a medical emergency. And these responses varied in terms of the timeliness or even willingness to show up. Um, I immediately, when I, I heard uh, Dr. Eric Rafleon's presentation, I immediately had to go and watch about the information um, on the Pittsburgh's Freedom House Ambulance Program, um, and, and it was amazing, so I also recommend that documentary. But um, in the 1960s, obviously, racial tensions were very high during this time between communities of color and law enforcement. Um, the Hill District in Pittsburgh was no different. And it was predominantly a Black neighborhood who experienced a lack of access to immediate and appropriate medical care. Um, out of that identified need birthed this Pittsburgh's Freedom House Ambulance Program. Um, growing up 45 minutes away from Pittsburgh, um, it's fascinating to me to hear about the city that I love. And again, I immediately had to watch that documentary and it was truly fascinating to hear uh, from the different individuals who were a part of that program. Um, 
And there was one particular gentleman that talked about his mother who had experienced a medical emergency and the police uh, refused to take her to the hospital stating that she was drunk um, and that they weren't going to transport her. He literally had to physically carry her down the stairs and he put her in the back of uh, what he referred to as a paddy wagon and, and she was taken to the hospital where she later died. Um, it was consistently stated throughout the documentary that calling police was a gamble with medical emergencies uh, in the Black community, and you really never knew what you were going to get or who you were going to get, and without that expedient medical care, um, people were dying. So the Freedom House Ambulance Program began providing that mobile emergency medical care. Um, they were the they were doing CPR uh, in the field, and they were providing IVs, and e they were even the first uh, to do a successful intubation in the field. Um, the Freedom House was employing young uh, Black men and women who were previously deemed unemployable, and they were having a huge impact on that community. And initially, the police felt threatened by the presence, but slowly started to see the value um, and really accepted them and began calling for them to respond. And one of the quotes was that um, when the police are calling for you, you know you finally made it. Um, and I know that in the mobile crisis side of things um, in the behavioral health system, um, we feel the same way. When police are actually calling for us to respond, we we know that we've made it and we know that we're starting to be successful. And I'll talk more about that uh, later on. But um, back to the emergency medical side, there was a lot of variability in the types of services that were provided on the ambulance, um, how many hours they were operating, and there was really a need uh, for standardization across the nation. And because of that Freedom House ambulance program, many policies and procedures were adopted from the very things that they were doing on their ambulance. Um, and I, I, my guess is if we took a survey of all of us and asked what we expect from emergency medical services today, um, my guess is that there would be very little variability in our answers because we typically know what to expect uh, when EMS gets on scene. And there's a lot of standardization now. And one ambulance from the next looks very, very similar. Um, and then on the behavioral health side, you know, we have also relied very heavily on both EMS and police to respond when individuals are experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Um, 911 is a very well publicized number that everyone knows. And that's typically what people call when they are in distress. And then what happens when we call 911? Well, either EMS, as we know it today, due to the, the Freedom House, or uh, police are sent out, or both are sent. And typically, uh, the outcome of those is that uh, the person either goes to the emergency department, the EDs, or they're taken to jail, both being outcomes on the behavioral health side that are not necessarily desired, uh, where individuals don't have ready access to behavioral health treatment, nor do they typically get the follow-up care that they need. And unfortunately, they can often experience much more trauma as a result of these experience. Um, and now, while it's recognized by many that in the words of Ron Bruno from CIT International, crisis care should not come uh, in a police car. In many communities, behavioral crisis care remains piecemeal or even non-existent, and that results in law enforcement uh, as the primary mental health responder. And often the most um, common pathways for people who are in crisis would be to go to an emergency department and they can languish in emergency departments. They might wait hours, days, sometimes weeks, or then obviously if they're taken by law enforcement, they can go to jail for potentially petty crimes. Um, and that obviously causes more trauma and stress in their lives and, and creates and continues that cycle of crisis. Um, and, and being from an agency in uh, Arizona, um, we, I've, I've been an agency that's embedded in the crisis system in Maricopa County, and there's a robust continuum of crisis services that other parts of the nation often have looked to for, for guidance or for assistance. Um, the Arizona model, as it's been called, is, is often referenced when talking about an effective continuum of crisis services with no wrong door. 
Um, and in Arizona, there is a desire at every level of service delivery to reduce interactions with law enforcement and to also integrate peers or those who have, and I've heard, I heard this term a few weeks ago, living experience rather than lived experience um, at every level of crisis care. Now, in an effort to move towards the standardization of effective crisis care, the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention put together a crisis services task force in 2016, and those recommendations resulted in the development of Crisis Now, which is a model that provides the fundamental components to a safe, effective crisis care system, and that diverts people who are in distress away from the emergency departments, as well as jail, by developing a full continuum of crisis care services that match whatever the individual's clinical needs are. Um, next slide. And in 2020, SAMHSA released their national guidelines for behavioral health crisis care. Now, just for a minute, please imagine 911 without ambulances to outreach or transport or without an emergency department to receive that person with higher level needs. Um, we should have levels of service on the emergency behavioral health side that we do have on the emergency medical side. Having the 988 number uh, alone is, is simply not enough. And within SAMHSA's guidelines, there were three core services that were identified the need to have. Next slide someone to talk to. So that is the regional crisis call centers, which act as the hub for services. Now, the majority of calls uh, are typically stabilized on the phone, um, but for those who actually have higher level needs, we need, next slide, someone to come. So those are the mobile crisis teams, those who can outreach the person in the community uh, to be able to provide crisis intervention services wherever the person is. Um, it doesn't matter. And then the majority of those calls can then be stabilized in the community. But again, for those with higher level needs, we need, next slide, somewhere to go. We need crisis receiving and stabilization services that are available for drop-off or walk-ins 24 hours a day, and they can help stabilize those individuals quickly. Next slide. Now, in, in SAMHSA's um, guidelines, they identified that there are minimum expectations. So these are the minimum requirements that would be foundational for crisis, crisis system services with those three core services. And then they also identified, next slide, what are best practices? And that's really raising the bar for these services? What are the, the components uh, to make a system best practice? So let's go into to each of those. So on, on the first, very good, thank you, uh, for the crisis call center for the hub, the minimum expectation, we want uh, them to be available to people every moment of every day. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year, even holidays. Um, we want those to be staffed with clinicians, um, overseeing those clinical triages, other trained members to also to be able to respond to calls received. Um, so there, even if it's not a clinician that's on the call, that they have access to uh, somebody with clinical experience that can provide that oversight to the individual. We also expect that they are able to answer every call or coordinate overflow coverage, um, that they also are able to assess for suicide risk that meets the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline standards and uh, be able also to assess their danger to others on each call also. And then that they are able to coordinate services. So obviously, you know, like I mentioned before, the Majority of calls are able to be stabilized on the phone, but for those who do need a higher level of care, how can we coordinate with mobile crisis services in their region and be able to send those mobile crisis teams to the individual who's experiencing the crisis? And then also to be able to connect 
to facility-based care also um, and coordinate that, that transport. So sometimes there's they skip the mobile crisis piece and go straight to the, the uh, facility level also. Um, and then next slide. In terms of incorporating, what are the best practices? So there needs to be um, some caller ID functionality. They need to be able to know who's calling. Um, this assists when you know someone is truly at risk for dying by suicide or hurting someone else, and they need to um, track the call to make sure that they send um, public safety out to make sure that the situation is safe. That's extremely important. They also need to have GPS enabled technology. So um, on our mobile crisis teams, all of our mobile crisis vans are enabled with um, GPS. And so the crisis call center always knows where our crisis mobile teams are in the field. And that helps with efficient dispatching, but it also is a safety issue also. We always know where our mobile crisis teams are and we can um, see on there, on the the dispatch, uh, the uh, excuse me, the the technology that they have to be able to see exactly where they are, and then to also be able to have uh, real time bed registries to be able to make those connections for those who need a higher level of care um, to the facility that has the most beds, and then they're able to also schedule outpatient follow up appointments. So when individuals need um, ongoing connection to ongoing resources and ongoing care, they have the ability to do that warm handoff and contact that provider and make those appointments uh, following a crisis episode. So that's the, the crisis call center. So that is the, the first core element uh, in SAMHSA's guidelines. Now, the next slide is about mobile crisis. So that somebody to come to you, right? And so this would, um, the minimum expectations would be that there's a clinician um, licensed or credentialed that has the ability to do a full risk assessment for the individual or the family and be able to um, respond appropriately and have good crisis intervention skills. Also be able to respond wherever the person is. So as I mentioned, um, you know, it doesn't matter if the person's at home, if they're at work or school, uh, it could be in the park. I always talk about doing um, mobile crisis interventions behind the back of a uh, Circle K, essentially. Um, and, and we don't wanna restrict services to specific locations. We wanna make sure that uh, we're available for individuals wherever they are. And then being able to connect individuals to those facility-based care, uh, that next core service um, through warm handoffs to coordinating the transportation. So for the most part, mobile crisis teams in Arizona are able to transport the people themselves. They do not need law enforcement to do transportation for them. They can uh, transport. Uh, and then next slide, moving into the best practices. So incorporating peers um, with the living experience on each mobile crisis team in, in at Impact in Arizona, we have a goal um, that we have uh, a lot of peers that are embedded within our mobile crisis team so that we can connect uh, much more quickly with individuals and families who are in crisis and be able to have that um, true engagement. And then responding without law enforcement. So I talked about that, like unless special circumstances warrant uh, safety issues to include um, Law enforcement, we do not want law enforcement involved. We want to be able, and for the most part, um, we're able to do that. Uh, and law enforcement, most of the time, doesn't even know that mobile crisis has gone out. Um, but it also, um, when I was talking about law enforcement, you know, when you've arrived, when police are calling for you, about 250 to 300 times every month, law enforcement is calling for mobile crisis teams when they engage someone in the community. Um, and that really shows that there's that partnership. Um, and on the converse, we are not calling law enforcement um, very much at all, except when there is a true safety concern. And then I always already talked about that GPS enabled technology um, that our mobile crisis teams are enabled with so that the call center has uh, more efficient 
uh, dispatching as well as uh, being able to see where they are for safety concerns. And then also being able um, to schedule outpatient appointments and having that warm handoff. Next slide. And then for the third uh, component of having an effective crisis system is um, the, the crisis receiving and stabilization centers. And they should minimum expectations is that they should be able to accept all referrals, walk-ins, first responder drop-offs, it doesn't matter. Um, they should not have to require medical clearance first before they're admitted, um, but rather they should be able to have, uh, be able to assess for those needs and provide support for medical stability while they're there. Um, and then be able to um, employ uh, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, uh, nurses, licensed clinicians, as well as peers with that living experience um, that is similar to the population that is being served. And then um, it also should be to be structured in a manner that that offers capacity to accept referrals um, at least 90% of the time with no rejection policy for first responders. So it's, it's that um, old adage of, thank you, may I have another um, in reference to, to law for enforcement bringing individuals into the program. And then for the um, best practices, they should truly offer a dedicated first responder drop-off area where law enforcement come in, they can drop off very quickly and get back to um, their main job of public safety uh, and let behavioral health be able to assess and deal with the crises. Um, and then also be able to have some intensive support beds so that internally, um, potentially or externally, they can deal with individuals who need longer term support. Um, and then obviously include their beds within that bed registry um, to be able to uh, have the crisis call center support that efficient connection to the needed resources. Um, and then I think the only other thing would be to say that, um, you know, we also have a, a huge need for coordination and collaboration between all of those levels of crisis care. And that's a, a huge thing in Arizona that we've been able to accomplish um, between all three levels. We have consistent meetings uh, and we really do coordinate and collaborate between all of the, our partners uh, to be able to ensure that individuals have effective crisis care. So, um, and that's that's it. I know I'm out of time, so I want to make sure that I leave time for the roundtable also. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, I'll pass it really quickly to the roundtable. Can I um, have Justin Chase and Paul Gal um, Galdis um, here for just a couple of minutes? If you guys could give a few sentences of reflection on what you just heard, that'd be great. Justin, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, Erica is... is uh, speaking so much truth in the way that that care is delivered and the success in Arizona uh, that we found. And, you know, there's never a perfect system, but there's always opportunities for improvement. But this uh, really is the best practice and um, finding a lot of success. And it's the coordinated effort, uh, support from the top, from the state level, through the um, managed care health plans that are uh, facilitating the uh, operations, and then the coordination between providers. Uh, we really found a lot of success. So, uh, we get the opportunity to serve as that crisis hub at the call center space and be able to coordinate with mobile crisis teams, um, dispatching 4,700 teams statewide per month. Um, the law enforcement coordination is huge. We're diverting 2,500 calls out of 911, preventing um, unnecessary use of law enforcement. Uh, but then we're seeing you know, over 1,200 times a month, law enforcement is out in the field and in need of the support, being able to send a mobile team out to coordinate there. Um, and um, Paul can talk definitely more into details on the facility-based side, but um, uh, we're we're lucky in, in in the resources that we have to to support the communities and the coordination of care, and really looping in technology as a way to ensure efficiencies, uh, safety um, uh, for for those that are out in the field, and um, and so we just find it um, find a lot of success that works for us in our communities that we serve. So with that, I'll pass it to Paul. Yeah, I, I think Justin and Erica said it really well already. The only thing I would say when we talk about scaling emergency responses is to start thinking about the language of emergency response for your mobile and your crisis receiving centers. Because when you start talking about these as emergency responses for mental health and substance use crisis, 
uh, you have you have really strong parity language that supports you uh, because we know the medical surgical side of things does cover emergency responses for those services. So questions around how do you fund it and how do you do those things? One of the ways you're going to be most successful reducing the burden on local taxpayers in the state is to get parity enforced, get all responsible payers paying. And I think thinking of these as emergency responses is key to that. Justin, Paul, thank you so much for, um, for that. And Erica, thank you for your um, presentation. I see a lot of questions and comments in the chat. So Erica, Justin, Paul, I just encourage you to take a look at that and um, respond there. But also, of course, anyone else in the, this virtual room who'd like to respond, please do. Um, I always find it extremely helpful to um, have presentations that are about the history of policy, because I think when you're doing the work day to day of trying to move systems, you, you can sometimes feel stuck seeing the, the slow rate of progress, but to get the analogy of how long it took us to um, move the emergency medical system um, and thinking about how long it'll take us um, to move the emergency behavioral health system to where we want to go, but recognizing that there is progress being made and there has been progress is so um, such a moment of hope for, um, for me in the work. And so I, I hope that other folks on the call also took that away. Um, next slide, I'm speaking fast because I'm recognizing that I'm behind time a little bit. Um, but um, actually, I think Justin was wearing a 988 shirt, if I'm correct. But if you're interested in having um, various um, 988 products, you can go to this link um, at SAMHSA um, and request them. And, um, as I recall, they're free, and it takes about four weeks or so to ship out to you. And there's also things that you can download as printable materials. Um, next slide. As always, um, if you would like a 988 um, Crisis Jam shirt, you can get those um, on the Crisis Talk website, but you can also get them by volunteering for the trivia hot seat and then you get it for free. So I think you know what you should do. I think you know you should volunteer. And that brings us up, I believe next up should be, um, yes, our um, hot seat. Justin, welcome. Thank you, Aisha. It's a pleasure to be here. You feeling anxious? You feeling good? <laughs> oh well I was just taking in that whole presentation so uh let's let's see where it takes us you know let's, I've been waiting all right <laughs> let's do this so Justin Lope is a certified recovery peer specialist um with Nashbin and Justin you're our um hot seat trivia so um I'm going to read you the question and then you are able to uh wing it just respond yourself you are also able to call a friend from the audience um, or you're able to see the um, the audience's responses as they're being put forward um, and go with the audience. So, so it's one out of three, not all three. <laughs> Get one option. Justin. Okay. Okay. In 2020, the SAMHSA National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care described the components of a modern emergency behavioral health system: 988, mobile crisis, and access accessible crisis facilities that would save countless lives. The authors cited an anonymous peer recovery coach who spoke of the stigma of blank that persists in the recovery community. What was it? Um, everyone should have just seen um, a screen pop up for them that they can click the button. So feel free to respond there. Um, and Justin, do you? How are you feeling? You're gonna wing it. You're gonna call friends. Gonna want to see what the audience. I, I have say? a lifeline. I have a lifeline. I I, I kind of set up. But I am curious, <laughs> since I only have one option, to see what the audience thinks before I answer. Okay. Well, I, I'm not sure if Karen's managing the audience part piece. Okay, so here's where the audience is. Uh, Close between C and D. Hmm. So the stigma. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with D. All right. I'm gonna Involuntary go with D. Voluntary hospitalization. Let's see how you did. Oh, should have went with the audience. Listen, that was a very close one. Um, and, um, you know, we know there's stigma about all of these, but what the authors did say was that the stigma of medication assistant treatment um, persists um, in the recovery community. So thank you so much, Justin. You get your free t-shirt. I know we'll have you back for the live lens section in, a, in just a few minutes. So appreciate your participation. Appreciate it. Next one. Okay, um, Stephanie Hepburn, I'm so excited to have you talk through this uh, crisis talk session with Dr. Sandy Schneider. So I'll actually just pass the mic to you directly. 
Thank you, Aisha. Yeah, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Sandra Schneider. She's the past president of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Uh, Dr. Schneider, can you share how current day emergency mental health is reminiscent of the 1950s emergency department? Yeah, so uh, first off, I, I wasn't working in the emergency departments in 1950s, but I did, <laughs> I, I did work uh, in the 70s. Uh, but so in the 50s, um, emergency departments weren't staffed um, by anyone. And when you showed up, um, you might find an intern, um, you might find a resident, you might not find anybody. You might find a nurse who would call somebody. So the system was pretty haphazard. Um, and depending on where you lived, that's what you got. Um, and I think to some extent, um, we've seen that in mental health. In the other case, when a patient came to the emergency department, um, they didn't always get specialist care. So if they came with a problem, the guy did, you know, the guy did the best they could and they sent him out and, you know, and they and there was often no follow up. Um, so the doc in the emergency department really didn't know if what they were doing was the right thing um, or, or the wrong thing. And I think in some cases, mental health is at that same stage. There, you know, I heard the conversation loud and clear just before me about standardization, mm -hmm. about knowing who's coming, about all, you know, when you call somebody by the name doctor, you're going to actually get a doctor, not necessarily an intern, no offense to the interns, say doctors, but you know, really, um, but you know what you're going to get. Uh, when you call an ambulance, you know what you're going to get. All ambulances are called the same thing. They might be called you know, Mayfield Ambulance, but you know what they're going to get. And I think part of the problem in the mental health field is you don't always know what you're going to get, and the name doesn't always tell you what you're going to get, particularly um, here I'm thinking about like facilities and the names for teams. Um, so when I send, I send a patient uh, out with a referral to, you know, Happy Days, I don't know exactly what that is. Um, so I think, uh, I think those are my first thoughts, um, but we've come a long way. So during, you know, one follow-up question since this article was from four years ago, right? So has there, during the pandemic and with innovations like 988, do you see some shifts in terms of that collaboration and partnership between emergency medicine and behavioral health? I think it's starting and it's starting. I mean, we just heard the, the wonderful story from Arizona. Um, but, you know, if you go to and I'll just pick a place, uh, you know, you go to another place, maybe Fargo, North Dakota, I'm not sure you're going to see the same thing. And I don't I'm, I'm sorry, Fargo, if you're on. The, <laughs> and I'm sorry if you have an ex exceptional system. Um, you know, one of the things we joke about in emergency medicine is, you know, whenever we go. Uh, if I go from one place to the next place, I have to ask, you know, how do I get a patient uh, committed? What do you do with suicide patients here? Who comes to see them? I don't, ask, you know, if somebody comes in with a broken leg and I'm in, you know, Fort Worth or I'm in New York City, the same person comes, okay? It's an orthopedist. Maybe I refer them to them, but it's an orthopedist and I don't have to say, who is it? How do we do it? You know, where it is. So, so things are, so things getting back to your question, have things gotten better? Yeah. But I think there is still a long, long way to go. Um, and I think there's a, a, a real need, um, you know, for, I think there's a real need to talk to the emergency departments and find out what's going on. I was having a conversation with someone I uh, met, uh, and I'm going to not mention their name, but they can put it in the chat. We had a long talk yesterday about standardization. And I said, you know, one of the things I need as a clinician is someone who's going to follow the patient up on the next day. So while a lot of our 988 stuff is based on anonymity, and I understand that, there ought to be a way for me to say to a patient, look, could I have someone call you tomorrow? Would you feel comfortable giving you giving me your number and would you take a call from the you know 988 folks uh, to see how you're doing tomorrow and if they said no then we're done if they say yes you know i mean not everything has to be anonymous i guess anyway sorry i butchered what i said yesterday well i appreciate you hopping on i think 
you know, with telehealth, it might be an interesting thought too. I mean, do you think yeah. with EDs collaborating through telehealth or doing consults, is that a way to kind of fill some of those gaps? Yeah, tele telepsychiatry is filling the void uh, in a major way. And um, actually we do a, some tele-emergency meds medicine. Um, and te so telehealth was sort of the big uh, advance. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't uh, um, thinking about that, but it's been the really big advance in emergency medicine. And we began to talk about, you know, why are we confined to the four walls? Mm -hmm. uh, why aren't we um, doing more um, in terms of seeing patients in their own home, in terms of caring for them in their own home, in terms of saying, you know, do you really need to come to the emergency department? You know, um, because, you know, we all know it's a, a bit of a, a problem once you get to the emergency department we don't see you real soon we got lots of other stuff going on and you think you have like the world's worst thing in the world and if I took a look at it I'd be able to say eh, put a band-aid on it you know <laughs> maybe a little need more and you'll be fine thank you so much for hopping on the call with us I appreciate it thank you I'll pass it back to you Aisha thank you so much Stephanie and Dr. Schneider I saw that there were some questions in um and comments in the chat, so definitely encourage you to uh, hop in there. Um, Justin, can I call you back up for the lived lens piece? Um, thank you. Sure, absolutely. So just to preface this, you know, you're, we love your comments on how we will know um, that we've achieved the promise of 988, um, that we're in a world where care really feels like care from your experience. So if I can post that question to you. Yeah, absolutely. And the first presentation was very relevant to my experience because if I'm in a, some sort of crisis or mood change and I'm not met with handcuffs, that will make a huge difference. I'd rather be met with a cup of coffee and maybe something to eat. And depending on the day, possibly a cigarette. And I'm sorry to say that, but, you know, I worked in the criminal justice system for a long time and um, it doesn't work. And people don't need to get arrested and be incarcerated to be able to get help in this country. And if we spent a fraction of the money we spend on other budgets, helping people with equitable issues, that you should be able to walk in or get help from any other place but the criminal justice system. You know, um, maybe it's a dream, but I hope to see it there one day where people, no matter where they're from, what language they speak, whether they're dressed in rags or coming in a three-piece suit, they're all treated the same. So that's my that's my uh, hopes for the future. And I appreciate you letting me share. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Justin. I think people are really resonating that you don't ever have to apologize for that perspective. That's a, a, uh, a deeply held and a, um, a, a very, um, um, the kind of perspective that we love to hear. So we really appreciate you coming up and sharing that. Um, next Thanks for having up, me. Next up, um, I'm going to call Tom Betlack to the stage. Back to the Thanks, stage. Aisha. For Hi, Tom. Thank How you. How are you? Thank you. And Justin, thanks for those comments. We're spending just a few minutes once a month highlighting how Medicaid is coming along and supporting and sustaining crisis systems in states. This week, we've got David Welsh from Idaho. He's the deputy administrator. David, how is Medicaid coming along and supporting crisis system development in Idaho? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Tom, and I appreciate the question. Um, we, we've got some interesting initiatives happening here in Idaho, and, and you know, by no means are we ahead of um, developing a really robust crisis system, but I think we've, we've done some really unique things here that I wanted to touch base on. Uh, so I'm really briefly going to talk a little bit about the current Medicaid structure and also talk about some of the services that we, we currently have, as well as a, a larger initiative where we are, we are working with our behavioral health authority here in Idaho to, to really take our crisis system to the next level. Um, so uh, again, my name is David Welsh. I'm the deputy administrator of behavioral health um, services or Medicaid services here in Idaho. Uh, you know, behavioral health has really been a, a primary focus for Medicaid as well as the state uh, supported by the governor. We've, we've seen lots of funding that's been put forward uh, to our behavioral health care system and over the past decade it's it's really just transformed and, and become you know a focal point of how we can really uh, meet members needs in the community and keep folks in the community versus uh, getting into ERs, hospitalizations, etc. 
So our current uh, Medicaid behavioral health system is a prepaid ambulatory health plan, which is a managed care entity that oversees the outpatient services for behavioral health. Now, the inpatient services are still managed at the state level. So they're fee-for-service reimbursement in the state oversees inpatient ER uh, residential services for behavioral health. So it's it kind of creates a fragmented uh, delivery system. Uh, and, and to either to further complicate that, our Division of Behavioral Health here in Idaho, um, our Behavioral Health Authority, also provides some behavioral health services, uh, some that are very similar to the Medicaid services and some that, that are different and, and not really funded or can be funded by Medicaid. So savings over housing, for example. Um, again, the, the future state really of what we're looking for um, takes our current behavioral health system, which offers recovery centers, so more drop-in centers that have peer supports. Uh, we have a 24-hour crisis line today. We have crisis response, crisis intervention, and we also have implemented uh, over the past couple of years adult crisis centers around the state of Idaho, which are jointly funded by the Division of Medicaid, so more of a fee for, more of a Medicaid reimbursement model for Medicaid-eligible individuals, as well as our Division of Behavioral Health, our sister agency, uh, supplements some of the funding from, from their agency through state general funds or block grant funding to pay for those individuals that may not be Medicaid eligible. So really, they, they those crisis centers act as a hub and don't turn anyone away and can bring folks in to be served um, and then figure out the reimbursement on the back end. So that's, that's kind of, I guess, the first stepping stone in where we're really trying to take our behavioral health delivery system especially around crisis services, because we want to be able to treat members uh, with their needs in the community and not have to worry about how it's being paid for until we resolve that, that, um, that crisis event. So and David, the, David, I hate to, David, I hate to cut you off, but I think that we're running out of time. So okay. is there anything else that you wanted to highlight like in 30 seconds? Cause I know Aisha has got a tough schedule that she's got to follow on her. Yeah. 30 seconds real quick. So the big initiative that we're working toward is a integrated managed care um, model, which takes our Medicaid funded services, our non-Medicaid funded services, and puts them all into one delivery system. So we can really treat folks holistically from a crisis perspective and use Medicaid funding, use non-Medicaid funding um, through you know, mobile crisis units, through adult crisis centers, through youth crisis centers, to again, meet those folks in the community and prevent hospitalization, uh, to include bed registries, um, and lots of other initiatives. And I, I apologize, I don't have more time to talk about this, but I'm happy to interface with anyone um, through questions or, or outside of this meeting. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Thanks so much, David. And you all have done a really good job, I think, of being thoughtful around that system design and system structure and how Medicaid can come along. And appreciate you just taking a few minutes today to highlight that. So, Aisha, back to you. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, David. And I see some also engagement in the chat there. So, really appreciate it. Um, uh, Dr. Richard McKean, I'm going to call you up for the SAMHSA update. Um, if you could uh, give us your two, three minutes on an update, that'd be fantastic. I'll talk quick. Luckily, I'm a New Yorker. I would <laughs> like to start by introducing a new member of the team in the 988 office, Alana Levitin, who um, has many of you may know for the great work she did as part of the Lifeline at Vibrant. Um, well, I don't want to say a couple of words of hello. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Richard. Um, I'm going to keep it really short and sweet and just say that I'm just thrilled to continue on this 988 journey with you all and look forward to, to getting an opportunity to collaborate with those of you who I haven't met yet. Thank you. And Alana has joined us as a senior policy advisor, so it's great to, uh, to have her. I will quickly mention a couple of different things. Um, one is that um, the 988 office recently made 23 tribal 988 awards. As you all know, we made 54 state and territorial awards several months ago. Uh, these are similar, but focused on, on tribes. Also, John Palmieri and uh, James Wright recently attended a California meeting that was focused on California tribes and the Lifeline Centers. Um, and one of the focuses there was learn to uh, uh, learn from the experience in the state of Washington and their Native Strong uh, project. 
where they are using a press four option to um, uh, connect uh, to American Indian uh, specific services in the state of, of Washington. Also, let me give you a, a quick uh, update regarding the press three option on LGBTQ youth. Um, you know, as you know, that the uh, lifelines now are for offering specialized call, text, and chat supports for LGBTQ youth. Um, it launched in September uh, 22 and provides the press three option on the phone as well as access through chat and text. At the moment, those servers, those specialized services are available between 3 p.m. and 6 a.m. And of course, chat and text more generally is available around the clock. Uh, there's been a tremendous demand for these services. It's currently accounting for about 5% of all calls routed in the network and 9% of routed chats and texts for about 111,000 contacts total, about 53,000 calls, 26,000 chats, 32,000 uh, texts. And then let me just mention that some of the things that were mentioned today um, are also being worked on uh, by working groups established within the federal government as part of presidential um, executive orders, particularly the military veterans executive order, which is also has language calling for um, specific recommendations more broadly on tribal access to 988 services. And then Sandy Schneider made some um, very uh, important comments regarding emergency department follow-up, how important it is the next day. SAMHSA has been supporting that um, over a number of years. The presidential executive order calls upon uh, the federal government to make recommendations about how we can institutionalize, incorporate, evidence-based suicide prevention, including screening, safety planning, and rapid follow-up in emergency departments across America. So thank you for um, the opportunity to give a SAMHSA update. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, I'll bring up Dr. Joan Gleese for the Nashville update. And Joan, I think you're gonna take us home. So I think you've got a solid three minutes. Great, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm really happy to, uh, to, to be here today. One of our um, jobs within the development of um, 988 and the implementation of 988 and crisis services has been develop products, developing products, products that could be easily picked up by folks to use immediately, whether it's a video, training manuals, et cetera. So a few of them that we've done, one is with Baltimore City Police called Be More Kind, riding around with them with a unique program that they do in community outreach. Another one called Making Re Relatives. It's a really um, interesting peer support model for indigenous peoples. Another one, Who I Am, it's um, the voices of people within the LGBTQ plus community who have been the recipients of crisis services. Um, we have many more in development, um, one for kids, one for faith communities, corrections, trauma-informed peer support, as well as um, community engagement. One of our focuses has really been on how can we engage non-clinical community programs in supporting the efforts of 988 and crisis services? How can we enhance the referral systems to be able to link people up to programs that might not be clinical, but will really help in terms of reuniting into community and can support individuals um, in need. So I'm gonna close with our final, um, this is uh, our most recent video. It's called Healing People, Healing People. And you know, I always used to hear the term hurt people, hurt people, but you know what? I think it can be healing people, healing people. So this is um, the story of um, several programs in DC. Um, you'll hear from the Metropolitan Police as well as Baltimore City, the city, families, peers, and individuals who have experienced crisis. This is a quick minute and a half, two minute trailer on our latest um, video that everyone can download. We'll send the link out to all of our products and it's called Healing People, Healing People. So thank you, Karen, for running it. My story is not just my story. 
You know, it's like my story is not my story. My story is about multiple stories that I picked up along my path. Like from New York, from Georgia, from Oklahoma. This is my 23rd area that I've been in. I've been through a lot of different states and I've talked to a lot of different people that suffered worse than I've suffered. And hearing their stories helped me. And I look at it like, well, if they went through it, I can get through my situation. You know, I, I talk to people. And sometimes that's the easiest way to break down a barrier between policing and community is to have a conversation. I wear a uniform, but I'm just as human. I make mistakes. We're all human. Realizing that the normal is not being normal. <laughs> and the definition of normal should not be a simple definition or a blanket definition because there isn't an easy normal. The best thing, obviously, is just to listen to what they're saying and try to find something to relate to it. And it might just be as simple as no one in the house that they're at listens to it. Anybody that I come in contact with, and I'm out here on a regular basis, anybody that I come in contact with, I am listening to what they're saying, actively listening. Because what I found when I was out here was that the only thing I had left was my voice. You know what I'm saying? Just to have somebody listen to me and see what appear is different because we don't have a time frame. We're not in a hurry. You know what I'm saying? We, we're not gonna build for that 30 minutes or an hour, in real talk. You know what I'm saying? So I got 30 minutes to sit here while you smoke your cigarette or drink your coffee and let's talk. That's the beauty of being a peer because you can really um, take time to let a person have their voice. People who have healed can help heal someone else. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to close us out. We'll skip the federal and state updates for this week, but join us next week when Dr. John Palmieri from SAMHSA um, is going to be um, joining us to talk about the most recent SAMHSA meeting. Appreciate everyone presenting and see you all next week.